الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الملك الحق المبين وأشهد أن محمدا رسول الله الصادق الوعد الأمين وأشهد أن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار All praise and glory belongs to Allah and Allah alone. And may the finest peace and blessings of Allah be upon the one after whom there is no prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we testify that no one is worthy of worship but Allah, the true ultimate supreme king. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his servant and his prophet and his messenger, the one who spoke the truth. And the one whose truthfulness was testified for from above seven skies. Salawatu Rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. As we testify that the most truthful of words is the book of Allah. That glorious, noble, magnificent Quran. And the best of guidance is the sunnah of the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the most dangerous of matters are the newly invented matters in the deen. For every newly invented matter is a leading astray that only leads to the fire. Where is this woman? This is a subject that first I thank the brothers and sisters, organizers, administrators, planners of this conference for choosing. For it's a subject of paramount importance and extreme urgency and at the same time it's a subject that most people ignore. And it's ridiculous, it's delusional thing that the ummah could return to its healthy state while ignoring half of it. And those are our female counterparts. May Allah protect them and bless them. And it is very true the statement of the one that said, indeed the woman, she is half of society. And she gives birth to the other half. So she is the society by herself. So if the sisters have been curbed or the sisters aren't given the due amount of care and nurture and education and discipline, then how can we expect from them to complete for us our shortcomings and how can we expect that their children will be any different? The path, the only path to resurrecting this ummah, as Imam Malik rahimahullah said, Nothing will fix the end of this ummah except what fixed the beginning of it. Going back to the roots, going back to the Quran and, and Sunnah with the understanding of the best of the ummah, these early pure generations of Islam. That's the only road. These men and women that had we not been certain and positively sure that they were human, we would begin to doubt, were they humans or angels? Rather, they are better than the angels. Because Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ Indeed, those that have iman and do righteous deeds, they are the best of the creation. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu says, even better than the angels. So we step back for this talk to some images of the glorious role model women who set the paradigm with the examples, the mentors during their lives and after their deaths for the men and the women alike. A few of their qualities and after every one of them ask yourself, where is this woman today? Firstly, with patience. That beautiful patience that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us was mentioned by Ya'qub alayhi salam when he went through what he went through with the loss of his family and being tried in his children and in his sight. He said, فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانٌ Then I will turn to a beautiful patience and Allah is the source of strength. 
A beautiful patience is a patience that leaves no hard feelings inside of you. You're not holding something in that you wish you could say, but it's because it's haram, no. A beautiful patience. The ceiling of patience that even deep down inside, you're all right. No matter what happens, because you're a believer and you know that whatever Allah has written is good. That's what a believer is. The hadith of Suhaib. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said what? عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ فَإِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٍ وَلَا يَكُونُ ذَلِكَ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ Amazing is the condition of the believer. All his affairs are good for him and this is only for the believer. Something pleasing happens, he thanks Allah, that's better for him. And something uncomfortable, troubling happens, he's patient and that's good for him. So this believer has this beautiful patience and as Allah says, وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا They submit wholeheartedly. Because they know that Allah is the master planner. And if you want to know if someone's patient, what you do is you look when the calamity first strikes. In Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi entered the graveyard and he saw a woman that didn't have this beautiful patience. She was sitting there crying by a grave. And so he told her, اتقي الله وصبري Fear Allah and be patient. So she didn't know it was the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa behind her. So she said, إِلَيْكَ عَنِّي Get away from me. فَإِنَّكَ لَمْ تُصَبْ بِمُصْلِبَتِي You're not going through what I'm going through. So later on, they told her that was the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa you said that too. So she ran to him. The narrator says, كَأَنَّ بِهَا الْمَوْتِ As if death has befallen her. She's that scared, that horrified. She said, oh Messenger of Allah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. I didn't know it was you. He told her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ أَوَّلِ صَدْمَةِ Or, إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ الصَّدْمَةِ الْأُولَى Patience is when the calamity first strikes. Soon as it happens, Alhamdulillah, إِنَّ لِلَّهُ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Not after they scream and rip their clothes and slap their cheeks and roll around on the ground and they say, you know, whatever Allah wrote is better. This is not patience. In Sahih Muslim, and here's our example, our guiding lights. Anas ibn Malik he narrates about Umm Sulaim. And Umm Sulaim is the mother of Anas. And Umm Sulaim is also Umm al Ghumaysa, who the Prophet وسلم, saw in a dream, and the dreams of the Prophet are revelation, that she was enjoying herself in Jannah. Listen to this woman of Jannah. Umm Sulaim, when they were in Medina, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi made the hijrah. Every person went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and offered him something. They gave him gifts. Who wouldn't? But who gave the gift of Umm Sulaim? Everyone is bringing the best thing they can. Umm Sulaim, radiallahu anha, she came with her son Anas ibn Malik and said, he's yours, O Messenger of Allah, in your service. What woman today during her pregnancy says something like that? Or when her child is like that? Like for example, the mother of Maryam. Whatever is in my stomach, O oh Allah, is for your service. We wait if the child comes out. If he's smart, intelligent, witty, he's going to be a doctor. He's going to be a lawyer. He's going to be an engineer. If the child comes out blind, or the child comes out with a certain disadvantage, خلاص, he'll be a sheikh. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ She says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, here's Anas. Anas ibn Malik says, I served the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa for 10 years. So she got the reward of that, plus we are to thank Allah for Umm Sulaim for all that Anas narrated to us. He narrated to us certain things that we would never have known were it not someone so close. We know about his manners. He said, I was with him for 10 years. Never did he scold me, yell at me, tell me about something I did. Why did you do that? Or something I didn't do. Why didn't you do that? Look at the manners behind closed doors. When no one's watching, he's still the best of example, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas says, I stared at the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I saw that in his beautiful black beard, he had 17 white hairs. Can you imagine that? 
such specifics we know through Anas ibn Malik who was the gift of Umm Sulaim to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Abu Talha came to marry Umm Sulaim. And Abu Talha was a rich man. She said, I am like any other woman would love to have a husband like you. Look at the loyalty. But you're a disbeliever. And I'm a Muslim woman. If you become Muslim, that's my mahr. That's all I'll ask for the gift of marriage. I won't ask you of anything else. So he came back. She would tell him the same thing till he realized she's serious. So he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and just so you don't think he became Muslim to marry her. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, this is Abu Talha. He has come and the light of Islam is beaming from his face, meaning he's coming to become Muslim. So he was sincere in that. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. She had a child, we're getting to patience, but there's so many benefits along the way. She married Abu Talha and the narrator says, no, we don't know of any woman who had a more noble mahr than this woman, a marriage gift. Some people asked her 10,000, 20,000, 5,000, a car, a ring. She said, my mahr is you becoming Muslim. They had a child. That child Abu Talha loved so much and he became sick, that child. And Abu Talha had went out on a business trip. And while he was out, that infant baby died. So Umm Sulaim said to the people of her household, no one tell Abu Talha what happened but me. And she washed her baby. And she wrapped up her baby. And she buried her baby. Then she came home and she cooked and she prepared and she put her makeup on. She decorated herself for her husband. And then when he came home in the middle of the night, she said, he first thing he asked her, how's the boy? She said, he's not complaining of anything. And so she fed him. And she beautified herself as the most beautiful of women. And they spent the night together intimately in the manner that a man and a woman do. And then before Fajr time laying with him, she said, Abu Talha, I have a question. If somebody lent somebody something, then they asked for it back. Do these people have the right to keep it? He said, no, it is theirs. What was borrowed has to go back. She said, فَاحْتَسِبْ وَلَدَكْ Then await the reward of your son. Meaning what Allah gave you, he took it back. So he became angry. And he jumped up and he ran to the Prophet ﷺ and he prayed Fajr with him. And he explained to him that what he did. And the Prophet ﷺ said, May Allah bless the both of you in your past night. May Allah bless that night for you. Look at the wisdom of this woman. Her husband is coming home. And we tell the women, your husband perhaps has to deal with a thousand faces. Gets a dollar from this guy and five from this guy and six from this guy and has to deal and they're not all the same. The dishonest and the honest, the kafir and the Muslim, the tricky and the trustworthy. And deal with every single one of them with a different face. And be patient with every single one of them and all you have to deal with is one person. So soon as your husband comes home, you meet him with the problems at the door. The Prophet ﷺ, he said on the day of Eid, O women, give in sadaqah. Because I have seen that you are the majority of the people of the fire. They said, why? He said, because you commit kufr. And kufr most commonly is referring to disbelief. She said, we disbelieve, we have kufr of Allah. He said, no, takfurna al-ihsan. You deny, kufr can mean deny, you deny the gratefulness. You deny the goodness of your husbands and you're ungrateful to them. And in the other hadith, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, were I to command someone to make sujood to someone, I would command the woman to make sujood to her husband, meaning out of how much right he has over her. And in the Musa, Imam Ahmad, Asma bint Yazid comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He tells her, do you have a husband? She said, yes. He said, how do you treat him? She said, ma aluhu mastata'at. I don't stop servicing him as much as I can. He said, انظري أين أنت منه. Be careful of where you stand from him. فإنما هو جنتك ونارك. For he is your paradise and your hellfire. We understand from the other hadith. Plus this one, what? He's your paradise if you're grateful. You treat him correctly and you're hell, the hellfire if he's of those, you are of those that are ungrateful to him. So why meet him with the problems? She comes and she prepares for him to relax from the travel. And she didn't lie. She said he's not complaining, the baby, because he had died. She didn't lie. She used an ambiguous statement. 
which in necessity is permissible. And then on top of that, she prepared, look at that, subhanAllah, the strength of Iman of this woman to have the ability to do all this. It can only be a believer that has the ability to all, do all this. She prepared even an argument. She told him if someone borrows from someone. And that's why he couldn't talk back. He had nothing to say. She stumped him. That's why he shut his mouth and he left. And a person should always do that. When you're angry, you shut your mouth. As the Prophet ﷺ said, because you could say a word that you'll regret it and won't be able to take it back for as long as you live. And so when the Prophet ﷺ said, may Allah reward you, bless you in that night, they had another child. That child, as soon as she gave birth, she gave it to her son Anas. She said, take this baby to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he, he took him to the Messenger of Allah. She told him, don't let anyone else breastfeed him either before you take him to the Messenger of Allah. So they go to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he takes him and he chews on some dates. And then he wipes the bit of that date inside and around the mouth of this child and he names the child Abdullah. So he was Abdullah ibn Abi Talha. And the child began the hadith says, to lick and pop his lips. Have you ever seen a baby one day old licking and popping their lips? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hubbul Ansar al-Tamr. The people of Medina, they love Tamr. Even from day one, they love dates, subhanAllah. And Allah blessed them in their offspring. And some of the narrations mentioned they had six or seven children, all of them memorizing the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moving on to another quality, the love of the Prophet ﷺ. In the Battle of Uhud, when the ambush occurred and the Muslims were injured and many of them were killed and the Kuffar tried to do what Allah only was able to stop them from doing. No one else. They tried to kill the Prophet ﷺ and they couldn't. And Shaitan screamed out, Muhammad is dead ﷺ. So many people thought he died. Many fleed, many threw their weapons down. This is why on the way back from the battle, a woman stops the fleet of the Muslims, says to them, after they said to her, your husband, your son, your brother, your father have all died in the battle. She said, where is the messenger of Allah? Can you imagine? She can't think of anything else. All the men in your family are dead. Where is the Messenger of Allah? They said, he is good. She said, I have to see him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they brought her to him. And she looked and they pointed. And then she told him, Kullu ya Rasulullah. All the catastrophes are light after I'm sure that you're okay, O Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imagine when a woman is like this. A woman of Iman. Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, لا يؤمن أحدكم, none of you have true iman, حتى أكون أحب إليه من أهله وولده والناس أجمعين, until I'm more beloved to them. Then their families and their children, all the people combined. When the woman is like this, this is her priority in life. How would her children come out as well? Her reward is hers, plus her reward is fed to her children. And her traits and those qualities are instilled in the children. So her children come out the way she wants. And they come out the way that it would make her happy to see them in old age. They'll be at her feet in the service of Allah, in the service of the parents. is implied in that. More importantly, the children will come out the way Allah and His Messenger want them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another subhanAllah incident, the most obvious of its traits, we will mention in Sahih al-Bukhari, the hadith of Asma, the sister of Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. She says, I married a Zubair ibn al-Awwam and he owned nothing but a camel and a horse, a steed. So I used to have to travel thuluthay farsakh. Some ulama say 16 kilometers, say 10 miles. She used to have to walk that. Every day, she said, so I would have to take care of this horse. And it wasn't a regular horse, it was a war horse. Someone that is very hard to deal with. And I have to travel to get the dates, the pits of them, the nawa, and I would have to grind them. And I would have to feed them to the horse to keep him healthy. So that Zubair can ride him in defense of the Messenger of Allah and Islam. 
and then I'd have to travel all the way back again on foot. She said, one time I was coming back, the Prophet ﷺ passed with a jama'ah, a group of the Ansar. So he saw me and he told the animals, the animal, ikh, ikh, meaning go down on your knees. So the animal or the camel he was riding وسلم, kneeled down. He told her, Sma, get on. He's going to drive her home. وسلم. She says, so I remembered the jealousy of a Zubair. A Zubair ibn Awam was known to be a very jealous husband. So she refused. She went back to her husband and she explained to him what happened. So he told her, You walking on, those, on your two feet is more painful for me than the pain of seeing you riding with a man. Look at how she takes into consideration before she does anything. It is not right for a woman to do something while she knows her husband hates it. She just wants to have her way. And we'll come back to that point in a minute. Also look at her haya, her modesty. This is the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And what the evidences appear to conclude as some of the ulama said, is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is a mahram for every woman. He can enter any woman's house. He can be around any woman without her husband or her father or her maharim being there. Unlike everyone else, of course. It shouldn't be taken from this that intermingling is allowed. Even culturally, we have this is very wrong. There must be a very clear banner of formality. Even when we walk, the Prophet ﷺ said, and his words are above every culture. When he saw the women crowding the men in the streets out, coming out of the masjid, he said, why do you do this? Go to the sides so you don't have to mix. So they would do so, the narrator says, to the extent that their garments would hang onto the walls. The Prophet ﷺ would pray in the masjid and after making taslim, if there were women in the masjid, he wouldn't turn around yet. You know, you turn around and you make tasbih and you face the jama'ah. This was the norm, but when there's women, he wouldn't do it. The narrator says, perhaps he did that so that the women could have time to leave. You talk to a woman formally. You talk to a man if there's a need for it. And you're not thin in your voice, you're not complacent in your speech. You lower your gaze, both of you look at the ground. There's no socialization with a woman or a man that is not directly related to you, forbidden for you to be married to. But her haya, even though it wasn't even haram, she still didn't want to do it. And then she took into consideration as Zubair, her husband. You know, many women, they get into many fights with their husbands. And they always butt heads and knock with their husbands. I'm going to do it, no you're not. I'm going to do it, no you're not. And subhanallah, look at the Zubair who is normally jealous. He says, you walking hurts me more than you riding. Even though normally it hurts him to see his woman in any scenario with a man. When you take into consideration your husband's feelings, that's the true way to get what you want. You're going to butt heads with him, you'll never win. He won't let you. But if you're kind with him and soft with him and you know how to deal with him, as they say, he's a ring on your finger. What you want, he gives you. If the wisdom were wise, the women were wise and caring, they would find that warmth in the house. And of course the men as well. When we go talk to them, we're going to go give them in their ribs too. We'll let them know what is upon them. The best of you is the best to your wives and I am the best to mine. And all of this. So when you want something from your husband, take into consideration his feelings, and that kindness will make him your prisoner. As they say, kill him with kindness. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Even if he's wronging you, Allah azza wa says, return the evil deed with a good one. And someone curses you and you say, Jazakallah khair. How bad would they feel? How guilty they would feel? Most people are like this. The biggest burden you can put on their shoulders so that they feel like they owe you is to be kind to them. Allah says, return the evil deed with a good one. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةَ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ What's the result? Allah says, you will find that the one that between you and them is enmity. Meaning they're your enemy, they'll turn into the closest, warmest one of your friends. As... Imam Tirmidhi says, there is no burden you can weigh someone down with, chain them with, like kindness, like being good to them. Next, look at the strength 
and the leadership of these women. First, let's speak about strength. Strength, bravery. Is that mine? Is that Allah khayra? Umm Umara, Nusayba bin Ka'b, read about her. She's there at the Battle of Uhud. When the Muslims are running away, she's running towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Normally, it wouldn't do, wouldn't do that. You wouldn't find a woman doing something like this. The people are running. She runs across against the grain, against the flow, and says, leave the weapons. If you're not going to fight, leave the weapons for those that are going to fight. And the Prophet ﷺ is unconscious. She doesn't care about her life. What is important? Allah and His Messenger. Unbelievable strength. Abnormal. The Prophet ﷺ awakens. He says he doesn't look to his right or to his left, except that Umm Umara is there. And she was gashed across her neck. An injury that later on re-ruptured. It opened again and it was the cause of her death. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. Abdullah ibn Zubair. When he was killed by who? Anybody? Al Hajjaj. When he was killed by Al Hajjaj, right before that, he was going to fight him. He stopped by his mother's house, Asma bint Abi Bakr. And Asma was old and weak and blind. She wanted to see her son, smell her son one last time. So when she came close to him, she saw that he was wearing lots of armor. She said, Oh, my son. There is no humiliation in dying if you're upon the truth. Imagine a mother telling her son this. Oh my son, I gave you birth to live for the sake of Allah. So why not die for the sake of Allah? You only die once. Why not be for him? She told him, oh my son, what you're wearing is not the clothes of someone who wants to die shaheed. This is too much armor. Subhanallah al these mothers. Nowadays, sometimes we see that our mother is so afraid for us. May Allah bless all of our mothers, the living of them and the dead. Say, Ameen. They're so afraid for us. Don't grow the beard. Don't, don't pray in the masjid. Don't, this is too much. They're so afraid we're going to trip and accidentally fall into Jannah. As one of the shiuch says, he goes, I don't want a son. He's saying, if it was up to me, I want a daughter so I can raise her to raise for me a son. And then look at knowledge and leadership. Firstly, Aisha radiallahu anha. And Allah, I want the sisters to pay special attention. She was the scholar of the Sahaba. Urwa ibn Zubair says, I don't know anyone, is her nephew, who met tons of the Sahaba. Anyone who was more knowledgeable in poetry, nor in medicine, nor in fiqh, in Islamic rules, than Aisha. Yeah, in literature, that's one PhD. Being a doctor, that's another you know, degree. And then fiqh, being one of the fuqaha, I don't know anyone who beat her in any of these three subjects. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, radiallahu anhu, he says about Aisha. He says, Aisha, radiallahu anha, never did a hadith be unclear to us, except that we would find this explanation with Aisha. Another says the shuyukh of the Sahaba, the elders, used to go to young Aisha radiallahu anha, asking her about the rules of inheritance, al-fara'id, al-irth. Where are these women today? Sa'id ibn Musayyib, the Imam of the Tabi'een, his daughter, the Khalifa, Walid ibn Abdul Malik, who became the Khalifa, he had wanted to marry Sa'id ibn Musayyib's daughter, and Sa'id ibn Musayyib rejected. And three days in a row, one of the students, his name is Abu Wada'a of Sa'id ibn Musayyib, didn't come to class. He didn't come to Halaqa. So when he finally showed up, he said, what happened? He said, my wife died. He said, why don't you get married? He said, get married. How can I get married? He's saying, all I own is like two or three dirham, two or three dollars, let's say. He said, I'll marry you for two or three dirham, meaning to someone. And he married him to his daughter. Sa'id ibn Musayyib married his daughter to his student Abu Wada'a for two or three dirham. They did the contract with each other. And then Abu Wada'a left. He said, I left to go find two or three dirham. He didn't even have them with him. He says, and I was fasting. So at Maghrib time, you're weak and you know, you're about to eat. All you're thinking about is breaking that fast, getting some sugar in the system. I hear a knock on the door. I say, who is it? He said, it is Saeed. 
He said, every single Saeed came to mind except my Sheikh, except Saeed ibn Musayyib. No way Saeed is knocking on my door. So I opened the door and he tells me, I hate it that you spend another night without a wife. And he, he brought him his daughter. Of course, the man couldn't believe it in Irish and says when she came inside, he was so shocked and she was so embarrassed that she passed out. So he went in and had to go call his mother. And one narration says that his mother said, you're not coming near her for three days. And they kept her and they calmed her down and they beautified her and decorated her. And all this, and then he missed class for a month. Not why we would miss class if we got married, a different reason. They asked him, why are you missing so many classes? He said, I found all the knowledge of Saeed, the Imam of the Tabi'een with his daughter. She taught me, I sat in her class. I didn't need to go to her father yet. And of course, our history records for us some of the mashayikh and al dhahabi in the 8th century after Hijrah. al dhahabi some of the shuyukh counted his teachers. And they said, we found in his teachers 104 shaykhahs, women. Ibn Asakir, the one who wrote the famous history of Damascus, an 80 volume book. He says, we checked for his shuyukh and we found that they were over 80 shuyukh from amongst the women. Without any disrespect. The most basic of things that is an obligation on them to know, they don't know it. I am not going to go too far into this. Go to islamqa.com. Look at what the sisters are asking. They're not being taught the most simple of issues. And that's not what we want. Yani of course we need and she needs to not be punished to know how to make salah, how to purify herself before the salah, how to recite Quran correctly. It's an obligation on every sister. But we want even more than that. We want these ulama of the women to lead also, instructing, teaching, being role models. Yani Sahih al-Bukhari, one of his narrators, her name is Karima bint Hatim al marwaziyya He says in the narration of Karima, the narration of Karima, nowadays which sister do we have who dedicates herself that whatever she narrates, we know it's truth. We can trace it all the way back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, of course, of course, the culture did a big load of damage to that. The women don't come to the masajid as often. And then their husbands come complaining after we force the woman to stay home and not learn the deen, as if that's her only job. The husband comes with my, my wife, she's not listening. My wife, she always wants me to buy stuff for her. My wife always needs this, that, and the third. Akhi, it's your fault. If she's to blame, you're also to blame. Because your fault you didn't connect her with Allah and His Messenger in the, the home of the Akhirah. Where are you from Allah's words? Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Protect yourselves and your family from the fire. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, How? Alimuhum wa addibuhum. At this ayah, he says, Teach them and discipline them. In Bukhari and Muslim, and I'm يعني, about to conclude here. Aisha radiallahu anha says that a woman came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa asking him about some of the rules of tahara, of purity. And he mentioned to her the ruling, just to be brief, of ihtilam, of a woman passing fluids after intimacy. It's ejaculation of a woman. So the woman said, a woman has fluid. A woman lets go of fluid when she's with her husband. So Aisha jumps in and says in some of the narrations, فَضَحْتِ النساء. You humiliated the women. How don't you know something like that? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَبِمَا يُشْبِهُهَا وَلَدُهَا If the woman doesn't have any fluid, then how would her son look like her when she has the baby? Of course she does. Then the woman replied and said, I will always ask, meaning for the knowledge, so that I will know. I'll never stop asking so that I'll know if I'm doing what I'm doing. Is it halal or is it haram? In the end, the last ayah I would like to mention, Allah Azza wa speaks about the women after their right to Allah and learning about that, also learning the rights of their husbands. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala says, فَالصَّالِحَاتُ قَانِتَاتٌ حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ بِمَا حَفِظَ اللَّهِ Then, the righteous women, are those that are qanitat and hafidhat. These three traits. The first of them is that they are salih. They are righteous. The second of them is that they are qanit. Ibn Abbas says, meaning obedient to their husbands in that which Allah Azza wa Jal 
makes for him an authority in, in those matters. And then they mentioned حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ They safeguard the secrets of their family, of their husbands. That Allah ordained them to keep a secret. The first of them that they're righteous. Why? Because if they keep the right of Allah, definitely then they'll keep the rights of their husbands. Many of the times, a husband lets his wife disobey Allah in front of him. So surely sooner or later she's going to come disobey him. The Allah's right is the source and the foundation for him to be given his right. And then he says, they are obedient. The Prophet says, indeed the woman, if she prays her five, and she fasts her month, I mean she fasts Ramadan, even in the month, the day she can't fast, she makes sure to make them up. She completes her month before the year is out. And she protects her chastity, her body, her private parts. And she obeys her husband. It will be said to her on the day of judgment. Enter into any of the eight doors of paradise you please. And the last one, حَافِظَاتٌ للغيب, They safeguard their husbands. The stereotype is sad, but there is truth to it. How much gossip goes on amongst the women? Even if they like their husband, they still tell his secrets. And what about when there's a problem now? Say for example, her husband does not keep one of her rights. She goes to complain to the shaykh. She mentions secrets that have nothing to do with the ruling. He's not spending on me. She goes, and he looks at girls, and he does this, and he... But what does this have to do with anything? حَافِظَاتٌ للغيب. They safeguard their husbands even in the things that he is wrong with. This is the definition of backbiting. Even if the brother or the sister has it, you safeguard it. You don't exploit it. And if they don't have it, as of those that make up things about their husbands, then you've mixed between backbiting and lying. You've slandered. Subhanallah, one of the shuyukh, and I'll conclude with this story as yani, a seal to the point of where is this woman. He came to the masjid, one of the students of the, the big mashayikh, crying. He said, what's the matter? He said, my husband, the husband said, my wife is sick. He said, Akhi, yani, you know, man up. Yani, your wife is sick, get over it. It'll be okay. He told him, no, no, you don't understand. My wife is different. He said, how? He said, I work for her father. Her father's the CEO. And I worked him for a lengthy period. And then when her, he saw how trustworthy I was, he took me even though I was very poor and he married me off to his daughter. And his daughter was used to a certain style of living, certain luxuries. That was a norm for her. And I was unable to provide that for her. We would eat simple things, live in a simple place. And every Friday, Jumu'ah, we would go visit her family's house. And then, you know, there's the turkey and the gravy and the food and drinks and desserts and salads, all that your heart desires. He says, so I became very bothered every time I went to her parents' house because I couldn't help. This is what she does once a week and she has, she's stuck with me for the rest of the week. Eating, you know, bread and, you know, little simple things, hummus and beans and things very... Uh, convenient for them at their financial ability. He says, and the wife, she realized that this bothered me. So one day we were at her parents' house and they brought out the feast again. So she said, every time, every time, every time we have this big meal, we have a party, I wish, I wish once I could come here and find some bread and some cheese and watermelon, something small. He goes, so that her parents began to think that I treated her the same way. So that I wouldn't be annoyed or bothered or feel embarrassed. So the shaykh told him, Wallahi akhi, he's one of the students of Shaykh Albani, rahimahullah. So Wallahi akhi, this, this wife, she's worth crying over. Cry akhi. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us that which will benefit us and benefit us with that which he has taught us to make what is remaining of our lives better than what has passed. And the ultimate best day of our lives, the day that we meet him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us sincerity in speech and in action, public and private. And to return through us 
the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to its rightful place amongst the nations of the world. We ask Allah to make us worthy to carry the message. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the men and the women an aid and not an obstacle in the striving and the da'wah of this deen. We ask Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala to use us for his deen and not to replace us, to honor us and not to humiliate us, to save by us the blood and honor of the Muslims in every corner of the world. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nshadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, wa sallillahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, jazakallahu khayran for your attentive listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.